Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, we shall be starting shortly. Uh, thanks for calling in. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, we should be starting in about a minute, so please hang on. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, this is Ignacio Davis. I'm the Director of Programs for the Center for Creative Land Recycling, uh, based in Oakland, California. I'm very pleased to have you join us for today's webinar, Power in Numbers, Area-Wide Planning. Next slide. We have a very tight schedule. And before we get there, uh, I we have a few housekeeping uh, items. Uh, the presentations uh, can be downloaded uh, using the console on the right side of your screen. Uh, a recording will be available after the webinar. So uh, if you miss something, if you're going too fast, you can tune in uh, in about a day or so and the recording will be available. Uh, if you have questions during the webinar, please uh, use the console, uh, the bottom side of that uh, console, uh, type in any questions and we will answer them at the end of the webinar or if you don't get to them, uh, one of the panelists will get back to you with a response. And please, uh, at the end of the survey, we shall be sending a feedback uh, survey uh, that we'd like, uh, appreciate you filling out so that we can provide, provide better webinars in the future. Next slide. Uh, a, little about, a little about the Center for Creative Land Recycling. We are a nonprofit based in Oakland and with an office in the New York metro area. And we work nationally to provide technical assistance to communities seeking to redevelop underutilized, contaminated, or abandoned land. We do that through workshops, webinars. We also engage in policy advocacy and community uh, and, uh, and research. And we have a consulting practice. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one assistance to EPAs, Technical Assistance to Brownfields Program, or TAB for short, which allows us to work with local government, uh, nonprofit organizations, and their partners to provide them with one-on-one -on -one assistance to support projects and programs. Uh, visit our website, at cclr.org. Contact uh, Sarah, Jean, or myself, or Erica, who's on the line as well, uh, if you have any questions. And next slide, Erica. And follow us on social media. We are pretty active. We have uh, post a lot of information uh, from our partners and there's, uh, there's a lot to learn. And, uh, and with that, uh, going to our speakers, we have uh, three very good speakers with us. Uh, Kate O'Brien is founder and principal of Catalyst Collaboratives, LLC which is a consultancy that supports equitable change across the U.S. And uh, C. Clear had the pleasure of working with Kate uh, on a couple of projects. Katie Rose Imbriano, I hope I got that right, Katie Rose, uh, is with BRS Incorporated, uh, and they focus uh, in, uh, on assisting communities in the New York and New Jersey area with environmental planning initiatives. 
And our third but not last speaker is Drew Wilson, next slide, with the City of Fresno. Uh, Drew is a project manager for the Brownfields area-wide plan in Southwest Fresno. And uh, he actually was uh, has served as a housing and community development commissioner for that city. Next slide. Before we get to their presentations, we have a couple of polling questions. So please, um, if you would kindly answer, uh, the first survey question is, what sector do you work in? Uh, we'll have this poll out for a few seconds and we'll uh, share the answers with everyone. All right, so most are with government and a few private as well. The next survey is, uh, do you have experience planning for a corridor or a neighborhood? Okay, well, pretty split down the middle with Folks, a few people who are not quite sure, you probably have if you, if you, if you have any doubts. And, and uh, Katie will start and will probably clear some of those doubts. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Katie and, I mean, sorry, to Kate O'Brien. And uh, so Kate, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ignacio. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I'm here on the East Coast, so we're in the afternoon mode. Um, next slide, please. So we're talking today about sustaining momentum. So um, one of the beautiful things about area-wide planning is you can do things in parallel. So you can do planning alongside uh, implementation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the roots of uh, the work that I have done related to area-wide planning, which was with Groundwork USA, um, a national organization with local roots in 23 communities across the country, working on, simply put, environmental community development. Next slide. Um, Brownfields is an important lever in Groundworks uh, place-based and also people-centric work, changing places, changing lives, and changing systems. Um, and a number of Groundwork trusts uh, have worked on area-wide planning projects in their respective communities, um, and we'll dive into some of that in a little bit. Next slide. So um, just a bit, a bit of framing to start off the conversation. So what is Brownfield area-wide planning? Um, it's an opportunity to look broadly at an area containing a concentrated number of brownfield sites. These often um, are re re uh, referred to as uh, environmental justice communities. Um, it's places where there are several brownfield sites that could be considered simultaneously rather than looking at a site by site or one in isolation. Um, it's especially important within the context of shared infrastructure and thinking about synergistic uses that would address current and anticipated drivers of a successful redevelopment effort. So it's an opportunity to integrate community engagement and analysis through partnerships and prioritization of sites, looking at existing conditions, uh, infrastructure analysis, and market studies. But it also allows an opportunity to actively balance this planning um, with leading stakeholder involved uh, engagement efforts. So site activation initiatives. Next slide. So why is area-wide planning important? Well, for a number of reasons. Um, it taught, it's an opportunity to build local capacity for engaging local stakeholders um, across sectors. So it, we're thinking about the business community, so private landowners, local government, sometimes state and federal government, uh, nonprofit community development organizations and service providers, um, fostering development and shared work toward a common aspirational vision for the future. It offers opportunities to practice shared leadership between municipalities and nonprofits. This is tremendously important, and I can't hammer on this enough, that every stakeholder has a, play, a role to play in revitalization. So nonprofits bring philanthropic resources that municipalities typically can't get. Um, similarly, cities get federal uh, formula dollars that, um, and can float bonds the way that nonprofits cannot. Um, it also fosters an investment and a reliance on one-on-one -on -one relationships and institutional and organizational partnerships. And this promotes community-wide resilience. So this is really helpful, um, useful in times of crisis or disaster that local stakeholders through these kinds of processes come to know one another and can stay connected, tap resources, or collaborate in responses. 
So it's focused on a specific area, such as a neighborhood, a downtown district, a local commercial corridor, or a number of city blocks, depending on the community and its scale. And it typically includes more than one catalyst site that would be the successful redevelopment of which would likely spur a positive domino effect or a virtuous cycle of momentum building on and around brownfield sites across the area and beyond. Next slide. So now I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly in the interest of time. Um, in the process of developing a report, and there will be a link um, in some of the resources and handouts, um, my team at Groundwork USA interviewed representatives from 10 um, communities that were funded by EPA through the former Brownfield Area-Wide Planning Program. And so we talked at length with project managers, partners, and local stakeholders in their communities, and looked at sort of distilling the trends and patterns that we heard over and over again. So what you have before you now is the top 10 facets of area-wide planning that we felt were really important to share with a field of planners and economic development practitioners, municipal leaders. Next. So in all of the area-wide planning um, projects and the project managers we spoke with, we noted that there are several traits that were shared amongst those leaders um, that supported successful outcomes. Uh, this involved a persistence in the face of opticals, so being adaptive, um, balancing uh, the management of a plan, and also being flexible enough um, by scanning the horizon for opportunities to achieve a win that might be celebrated in the community. Um, and also project manager continuity. Uh, that means preserving and sharing institutional memory, especially in times of leadership transition. Next. So maintain flexibility with project goals and timelines. So while the process to develop an area-wide plan generally can run around two years, the implementation phase can begin before the planning itself and will absolutely continue on after the planning is concluded. Um, so successful brownfield area-wide planning communities appear to manage their stakeholder expectations effectively by projecting longer than expected timeframes for redevelopment projects to happen, um, to witness changes in market conditions, and to realize these bigger aspirational visions. So workforce development and wealth building, right? It takes a while for those things to unfold. Next. So activate an array of project partners and stakeholders. So this can make for a really dynamic recipe. Um, a multitude of stakeholders across the community who become invested for the long haul. You mentioned that really extended timeline. Um, important considerations for project managers, thinking about the type of consulting firm that they would engage. Um, rarely does one firm or organization do every kind of work that might need to happen over the course of an area-wide planning project. So it takes many cooks in the kitchen to create this momentum building masterpiece. Next. We noted that the area-wide planning uh, projects that uh, we featured in the case studies, um, there was community engagement was incredibly creative. Um, those efforts were best sustained in places where the project team retained or tapped community-based organizations whose constituencies of resident stakeholders were far-reaching and where the one-on-one -on -one relationships were deep and trusting and where that trust had been hard-earned. Um, we also saw those area planning communities who found the great success they were looking for thought outside the box in terms of how to define community engagement. Um, they enjoyed robust turnout at their project meetings. They went out to the community to meet them where they were um, and really sort of shook up um, how to get people involved in um, what can be often a way to um, uh, marginalize people from being involved in planning in their community. Next. So pivoting around catalyst sites. So it turns out that identifying catalyst sites can be a fluid process, and we learned that um, in speaking with area-wide planning project managers, especially on the conditions on the ground and the local market changes. Um, many area-wide planning communities found that careful management of property owner relationships, in other words, winning over hearts and minds with an ambitious implementation vision for the future, is critical to sustaining the engagement and involvement of property owners over the long haul. And sometimes you'll get a site owner that just doesn't want to participate. And so you've got to be able to move on. Uh, so multiple irons in the fire are key. Next. So managing to the market you have might seem like an obvious thing, but um, project managers who characterize their work assignment as one that required them to manage to their market realities, um, rather than remaining fixed on a predetermined vision, uh, were able to guide a more dynamic process. So those who accepted the marketplace reality, whether it was unpredictable or stagnant or somewhere in between, 
seemed better able and equipped to manage and respond to the expectations of local stakeholders. Next. So planning for policy and legislative change. So area-wide planning is commonly thought of as planning or engineering or design-oriented exercise, but a few of the grantees that we spoke with also focus on the regulatory structures for which policy changes and legislative fixes can directly impact public um, health outcomes and day-to-day -day quality of life. One major uh, example of this that we saw a couple different times was the zoning analysis and revisions that were often necessary when a community sought to promote a brownfield reuse uh, or an incentivize, uh, incentivize adaptive or mixed land reuses in former industrial areas. Next, planning with an eye toward implementation. I sort of started off and framed it this way earlier, so I won't get into it too much, but um, that alongside a more technical analysis or a market real estate analysis um, and studies that are traditionally led by consultant teams, a more flexible ap approach would involve messier hands-on implementation activities. So engagement um, of the community through the arts, through pop-up site activation strategies, through creative um, youth education and development opportunities, uh, really provides a way to get people engaged and excited about the future um, and are willing to stick it out over the long haul while things kind of take a while to turn around. Next. The leverage and layer resources. One thing that became crystal clear to our team uh, following conversations with project managers was how much of a sustained and a consistent effort is required to attract and uh, create a continuing pipeline of funding for planning and implementation. The area-wide communities that seem to do this best um, talked about it in terms of putting multiple irons in the fire with great frequencies. They were always getting out grant proposals. They were always working with their nonprofit partners to cultivate donors and funders. Those communities whose funding pipelines were most robust also seemed adept at utilizing one successful grant award after another to demonstrate the existence of capacity and momentum. So really leveraging uh, to create a scenario that would be attractive to prospective funders and investors. Next. Finally, realizing tangible results incrementally. Um, brownfield redevelopment in former manufacturing communities, especially those that have faced decades of stagnation and foreclosure and land vacancy, often takes more time than local stakeholders hope it will. Um, much of the community revitalization work revolves persistent effort over many years and decades, so it's really important to build and sustain redevelopment momentum, achieving small, incremental, interrelated victories and celebrating them broadly across the community. So project teams that were made explicit links between redevelopment goals and tangible health and economic priorities um, appeared to cultivate greater levels of buy-in. So access to wealth building opportunities, youth and leadership development, job readiness and job training, job creation. Thinking about all these things and attaching brownfield redevelopment to real life scenarios will help people stay involved and see benchmarks along the way become realized. Next. So to kind of close out, um, area-wide planning is totally transferable. Um, you can, it's really customizable and can zero in on the things that your community needs and types of studies and data that might already exist in your community uh, might mean you take a different approach than another place will. Um, the next slide is a link um, and information. If you go to groundworkusa.org, you can access the report uh, that I cited extensively here and dig into some real case studies um, and see some uh, good examples of the work. And uh, the last slide, if you would like some support, um, also in complement to CCLR's technical assistance, uh, Groundwork USA runs a technical assistance program also funded by EPA with a focus on environmental justice and equitable outcomes. Um, there's a number of tools and resources there um, that might dovetail nicely with uh, the offerings of CCLR and other TAB providers. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention and would be happy to take questions at the end. Thanks so much, Kate. And now, uh, Katie Rose with BRS. Take it away, Kate. Hi, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Uh, my name is Katie Rose Imbriano, and I'm a planner with BRS. We're based out of New Jersey, and we're a multidisciplinary firm that assists public sector agencies with establishing brownfield redevelopment programs. I really want to start out by affirming all of what Kate had mentioned in her lessons learned, because the case study that I'm going to present to you this afternoon is going to show how those principles work in action. 
And I'm also going to show some of the lessons that we learned that helped our plan to be successful on the back end. So if you could go to the next slide and actually probably the one after that. There we go, perfect, thank you. So we've recently worked on three different brownfield area-wide plans that were funded with the EPA brownfield area-wide planning grant. The one that I'm talking about today is the Mount Ephraim Choice neighborhood of Camden, New Jersey. But we also worked on the Bronx River Sheridan Expressway plan in the South Bronx, New York. And we're currently working with the Geneva Road area in the city of Orem, Utah. On each of these, we have partnered with the planning and design firm WRT. And many of the visuals you will see throughout this presentation were developed by their staff. So it's just another example of how it takes a partnership both on the consulting side as well as with the community and community stakeholders to realize implementation of an area-wide brownfield plan. Next slide, please. So the case study that we're gonna be discussing today is again, the Mount Ephraim neighborhood of Camden, New Jersey. In 2015, EPA selected the Mount Ephraim Choice neighborhood to receive $200,000 in a brownfield area-wide planning grant. Now, as Kate had mentioned, that grant doesn't exist as it did in 2015 and prior. However, a lot of the activities that were able to be performed under that grant have now been rolled into the EPA's assessment grant program. So just to center everyone who may not be as familiar with the East Coast, um, Camden is a city of approximately 75,000 residents. It's located immediately west of the city of Philadelphia across I'm sorry, immediately east of the city of Philadelphia across the Delaware River. Um, Camden has a rich industrial history and it dates to the early 19th century. It was home to a diverse group of manufacturing businesses, including glassworks, lumber firms, woolen mills, chemical plants. And it was also home to some major companies, um, namely RCA, the New York Shipbuilding Corporation, and it is still the headquarters of the Campbell Soup Company. However, as many of you may also be aware, in the second half of the 20th century, Camden has experienced a well-documented industrial and population decline, similar to many other Rust Belt communities. Next slide, please. The Mount Ephraim neighborhood of Camden was the target of this area-wide planning grant, and it is important to center ourselves on the fact that this community has significant environmental burdens and significant environmental justice issues especially when compared to other parts of Camden County. Um, it is a one, nearly 100% minority community, and it is the site of a county incinerator and a county sewage treatment plant. It is also the location of many brownfield sites, including abandoned dry cleaners and gas stations, and um, abandoned and commercial uses along this, the neighborhood's main commercial quarter, which is also called Mount Ephraim Avenue. In addition, an interstate, 676, forms the western border of the neighborhood, which cuts it off from the city's waterfront and points to the west, where some of the revitalization that has been successful in Camden is occurring. Um, some people are familiar with the aquarium, the um, Rutgers campus uh, in Camden. So there's a lot of uh, positive revitalization happening west of this community, and yet it's cut off because of these physical barriers. Also, to give you an idea of the current real estate market, vacancy rates within the Mount Ephraim neighborhood can run over 20% compared to 16% within the city overall. And the project area experiences significant challenges with public safety and crime. In 2012, the violent crime rate in Canada was nearly seven times that of the national rate and nearly nine times that of the state rate. So it's important to know that while this neighborhood faces some significant challenges, the planning area also has some significant assets and redevelopment potential. Next slide, please. The Mount Ephraim neighborhood is the location of one of the city's major employers, that being Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital, and it also has a high-speed rail station. In addition, in 2012, the city received a $300,000 choice neighborhood planning grant for this area to redevelop, to develop a plan for the redevelopment of two public housing projects. This plan was developed by our partner WRT, and then the same year that we kicked off our brownfield plan, the city received an additional $13 million to implement the choice plan. So again, you see this layering of funding resources that Kate was talking about. 
So because of this, we started off this plan with the aim of ensuring that the redevelopment scenarios proposed for the neighborhood's brownfield sites were consistent with those of the Choice Neighborhood Plan and that we were working in tandem. This includes supporting economic redevelopment of the commercial corridor and improving recreation and green infrastructure opportunities. Next slide. So in terms of how the project proceeded, some of the activities that we engaged in are shown here. This includes robust community engagement, reviewing existing planning documents, conducting a brownfield inventory and prioritization, which I'm going to discuss in a little bit more detail, reviewing existing environmental data, which was um, a good role for our company because we have been working with the Camden Redevelopment Agency on implementation of other brownfield grants, so we have a good working relationship not only with the city but also with the state regulatory agency. We also conducted a real estate market assessment and infrastructure analyses. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, developing a brownfield inventory was one of the first steps that we took towards assessing and remediating brownfield sites. The plan planning team identified brownfield sites in the project area, cataloged their size, ownership, condition, redevelopment constraints, and any other information that we thought would be useful to inform redevelopment potential. We presented this information not only to the community, but also to community stakeholders who formed our steering committee and developed a brownfield prioritization to rank the brownfield sites for which ones we would develop scenarios for in the next part of the plan. Next slide. One of the Camden Mountie from Brownfield's area-wide planning goals was to create a toolkit of community-supported strategies for the reuse of these brownfield sites that ranked highly in the brownfield prioritization process. So the template shown here illustrates the reuse concepts that were developed for the brownfield sites. These include opportunities such as parks, green stormwater infrastructure, urban agriculture, infill housing, neighborhood retail, and mixed use. Next slide, please. So the catalyst site for our plan was the Camden Lab site. The Camden Lab site is about three and a half acres and it's just blocks away from a high-speed commuter rail station. It's in a predominantly residential area and is adjacent to a major community park, which is called Whitman Park. The site's history dates back to the early 1920s when it was developed as the city's hospital for contagious diseases, and it was also later used as medical laboratories that has been vacant and abandoned since about 2008. Next slide, please. So you can go to the next one as well. So the Capitol site had a proposed redevelopment of an extension of Whitman Park. And this is important because it dovetails with the choice neighborhood priority of developing parts of the neighborhood for green stormwater infrastructure as well as recreational opportunities. In addition, the site was adjacent to an existing park and there was strong commitment on behalf of the community for redeveloping the Camden Lab site as an extension of that park because of the need for additional space for program recreational activities. Next slide, please. So the plan document incorporated the feedback that we received from community meetings, presented redevelopment concepts. We also conducted funding research on behalf of the Camden Redevelopment Agency to identify potential resources to implement the plan at all levels of government, as well as from nonprofit and private resources. The most important thing to pull out, and which I will identify as my first lesson learned for this plan, is to identify the activities necessary to achieve implementation of the plan and the responsible parties for each. Next slide. To build on what Kate said, planning for implementation is really key. Um, it's important to ensure that proposed redevelopment scenarios are implementable based on environmental conditions and market realities. This is particularly true of a neighborhood like Mount Ephraim where you have high vacancy rates and very limited demand for various market sectors. Next slide. So the implementation roadmap we established 
shows that the area-wide plan falls primarily within the pre-development phase of brownfield remediation, with the next steps being to investigate and analyze the extent of contamination on the site and determine the appropriate actions that must be taken to clean up the site before the park redevelopment can occur. So the plan details the actions that must be taken to achieve these short and long-term steps. We're happy to report that the Camden Labs property has already begun along this path. The city acquired the property through foreclosure and it received a $344,000 Bramfield assessment grant from the EPA to do the assessment work. We are well along the path of implementing that grant collectively with the Camden Redevelopment Agency. And early last year, um, BRS worked with the city of Camden to secure an additional $200,000 through an EPA Brownfield cleanup grant. And then finally, Following site cleanup, Camden County has committed to spending up to $5 million from their capital budget and open space fund on the proposed Whitman Park expansion, including final design work. Um, you can skip two slides. The two other lessons that we learned that I thought would be important to pull out for today's presentation can be combined in the sense that they really work hand in hand. One is to explain technical terms and jargon in a manner that is easily understandable. And the second is to work with community members to ensure that they are knowledgeable about environmental conditions in their own neighborhood. We found through our community outreach that residents are understandably concerned about health outcomes and whether they or their families are at imminent risk of harm from living, working, or playing near these identified brownfield sites. So it is really important to acknowledge these concerns from the beginning and when available, provide information on environmental conditions that address these concerns. However, you can't do that effectively unless you explain technical planning and environmental terms and jargon in a manner that is easily understandable. I think we as practitioners in brownfield planning, assessment, and in remediation frequently use terms that are unfamiliar to most people outside of our line of work. And therefore, it is critical to engage plant stakeholders using language that is familiar to them and to clearly define technical terms when we do use them. Next slide, please. To that end, our partner WRT produced this terrific handout that is a user-friendly reference guide. It provides an overview of the program and process for the Brownfield Area-Wide Planning Grant. It provides a very easy to read map showing the sites and recommendations for each site. It defines key terms as well as timeline, partners, and the same uh, outline that you just saw about the timeline for the remediation process, as well as contact information for the planning team. So this allows us to enter a community engagement scenario where the community participants are speaking on an equal playing field to the consultants and they can contribute in a way that is meaningful for them and communicates their concerns about the planning process and about the nature of the environmental um, remediation that they hope to see. So you can go to my last slide. So I know that's a really brief overview of what is quite a complex and in-depth process. But if you have any questions, you feel, feel free to send me an email. And the full plan is available as a handout um, on the handouts that are shown on the right-hand toolbar. And I thank you for your time this afternoon. All right, hello. My name is Drew Wilson. I'm a planner in the Long Range Planning Division for the city of Fresno. Uh, I was born and raised in Fresno. Some of you may know Fresno, um, and I'm a boomerang back. So my goal was to come back and uh, I'm gonna give you all a, a case study on a project, an area-wide plan that we conducted in Fresno and Southwest Fresno that ended up being kind of a project of my dreams. Um, I'm gonna go through some of the, the lesson learned throughout the process. Next slide, please. So in order for the, the plan to be successful, um, some of the some of this was already touched on. There was three elements that we focused on to ensure we acknowledge of why we're here. Um, engage as much as possible um, and be mobile in your engagement and then involve people. So you're, it's this, the process takes partners 
throughout the entire time from development. We're still uh, don't have a completed plan yet, but we keep the community involved. I'm going to go through how we did that. Next slide, please. So why are we here? We have to acknowledge why we even need a brownfields plan uh, in Southwest Fresno. Definitely had a need for that. Um, one of the tools to to identify why it's needed is Cal Enviro Screen. This is developed by the Cal EPA. It's the California Communities Environmental Health Screening Tool. Uh, this identifies California communities by communities by census tracts that are disproportionately burdened by and vulnerable to mar multiple sources of pollution. If you go to the next slide. We look at Fresno, which is right in the center of, of California. There's a lot of red there, um, especially to, to the southern end of Fresno. There's a little triangle right in the middle next to the word Fresno. That's our downtown triangle. Uh, and like a lot of communities, we had spra sprawl galore. Uh, Post-World War II, we expanded north to no end, and that left the, the southern part of the city neglected and forgotten for quite some time and put us in the position we are now. Recently, the city has shifted and focused on some of the infill, and that's why we're focusing on some of these communities that are disproportionately affected by some of the historical um, uh, conditions that have been there for quite some time. If you go to the next slide, please. So the, the Cal Virus screen looks at census tracts and it looks at the, the pollution burden and what percentile they're in. So the higher the number, the worse you are. In our project area, which this is Southwest Fresno, it's the reddest of the red and it's, kind of, it's in a lot of the areas, it's the reddest of the red in the state of California. So in this project area, all of them are in the 95 percentile, but most of them are in the 97 to 99 percentile. Um, and the city had to acknowledge this. This is something that had been going on for quite some time. Um, and, and the community had made quite a, uh, uh, its voice heard and the city had neglected to really recognize it for, for a long period of time until recently in the last five to seven years. Next slide, please. So this is something they've been fighting and been feeling. So this photo is of the community members who were protesting a plant that's behind them. It's an industrial plant, it's a rendering plant. Just to give people an idea of what's going on, that rendering plant renders uh, dead cows into a variety of different products primarily used for other agricultural purposes. The city of Fresno gets upward of 115 degrees and oftentimes will be in the 100 degrees during the summertime. But it's a dry heat, it's very nice and you get used to it, I promise. Um, the issue with this is that it, it creates a horrible smell, especially when there's prevailing winds. So not just is it there and it's causing environmental issues that you don't recognize, but you're smelling it on a daily basis and you're affecting it. When you have tons of trucks that are going through your neighborhood, um, it's definitely something that creates an issue. Additionally. Um, the industrial that was in the neighborhood only ha had a total of 2,935 jobs, but only 212 of those were occupied or, or, ha or um, held by residents in the neighborhood. So they were feeling the effects of it and they were feeling no, no, no benefits. So there's no jobs. And additionally, just to, to give you all the severity of the issue, the lifespan difference between somebody in Southwest Fresno and Northwest Fresno was a 20 year difference with Southwest Fresno's residents living an average of 20 years less. So this is definitely something the city had to acknowledge and we did this um, by any way we could. Um, and that started with different planning elements. Next slide, please. As we all have probably been aware of, we can plan our hearts out, but that doesn't necessarily lead to anything. So we, from 2011 till today, we had a lot of plans that looked at Brownfields, especially in Southwest Fresno. There was action plans and urban greening plans. Um, how do you create infill? Um, these were all done with the help of uh, uh, different partners. Seaclear was on a lot of them. Uh, local Fres our local university, Fresno State, was a part of it. And our old RDA was, was, was also part of it. And now we're at the point where we're creating a revitalization plan for Elm. And that came from the first plan, which was the West Fresno Brownfield Action Plan. Uh, if you go to the next slide. That was just the start of planning. We definitely created planning fatigue in the neighborhood and we knew that we had to address that head on. Um, so we had to acknowledge that we had been talking for a long time about what the city needed to do and what some of the opportunities were and what the city was gonna move forward with, uh, but we hadn't actually done anything. Um, and a lot of that was talking directly about what community wants to see, what the development types are and where they wanna go. Um, we, we created an idea of what this neighborhood could potentially look like with the neighborhood community plan, we had a specific plan that covered part of the area that, that changed some of the land uses and created a vision. We had a, a complete streets plan that was uh, conducted on the southern end of the corridor. Uh, but again, all of, all of these are conceptual in nature. Um, the specific plan and 
downtown Ambridge community plan did have an associated environmental impact report, which allowed for an ease of development, but that still didn't lead to anything um, concrete. Uh, the city also had, hadn't really done an EPA plan so that we knew that we were going to have to take lessons learned from all of these uh, and we're going to have to involve the community throughout the entire process. Go to the next slide. What we had heard from a lot of people that partners was definitely the way to do it and that's what we did. So uh, as my, my son loves to say, teamwork makes the dream work and that's what we did here. So we had Groundwork USA, we had the Strategic Growth Council, we had uh, Council for Development Finance Agencies, uh, Weston, which is an organization that did a lot of our phase one, phase two, and CClear, who's been awesome throughout this entire process. And we knew that because we were new to the game and we didn't really know what we were doing, which I'm sure some of you guys are currently in, and we were also behind. We had gotten a grant in 2015, and we were definitely the latecomers, um, and we were, we were slacking off. Um, we, we did do that because we wanted to ensure that the vision and land use determinations were decided for this project area, but we needed to get moving um, and we had procrastinated long enough. So once we heard about the idea of tabs, we went full force and, and we knew that the, the partners that we were gonna bring to the table have seen a lot and they were gonna provide us with information and tools that could help us um, go through this process and make it as successful as possible. Next slide, please. The biggest issue we felt, uh, which um, is where groundwork came in was, and I, uh, Katie Rose mentioned was technical terms and jargon. And also, so how do you explain that that site on the north, which was a old meat packing plant that is full of contamination to residents? And how do you how can you tell um, put them in a position to feel like they understand what it means to go through an area wide plan, what brownfield terms and jargons are, um, and what it means to 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 get rid of contamination and move towards redevelopment. So one of the recommendations from Groundwork was to train the trainers. So that's providing tools to the community members and folks who are going to be a part of the process and adding value to the work that's already being done in the neighborhood. So we got together with steering committee members. We got together with folks from uh, uh, local champions, community groups, everybody that we could, as, as Katie mentioned, brought them to the table to teach them um, some of the terminology, some of that jargon to get us over that one big hump because these are the people who are going to go out and be speaking to other residents and helping us throughout some of the outreach. Next slide. Um, again, the engagement is engaging everybody you possibly can. So we, we conducted a photo voice project. This was with local students who, who lived in the project area or, or attended school in the project area. We provided a variety of services with them. They, we did training at our local community um, media collaborative. We did walking tours. We did some of the train the trainers with them. Uh, we did training on, on how to take good photos, how to talk about it. We also did speak training, um, um, public speaking training. It was awesome. Friendships were formed, not just among the students, but also between city staff and project members. And to this date, I still am in communication with a lot of these students. It was an awesome experience. Um, and the reason that we did this, next slide, was to, to provide some artistic imagery that allowed for the, the community and some of these students to have difficult conversations about some of the effects that, that the Brownfields um, had on their community. So the idea of being shut out, the idea of not being connected, not understanding why development isn't happening, um, why some people are in certain situations, why stuff is boarded up. And, and some of the things you hear, the, the photo on the top left is of an alley and the Stefan who took that photo, his vision for that alley was turning it into an alley, which he didn't even realize the term was, but a livable alley by putting benches and lights and trees and making it a pretty place for people to walk. Um, and I think the thing that really hit home for, me, home for me on one of the walking tours was the house in the center. As somebody said, you know, I've never really looked at this house um, with, from this perspective, but I know somebody who lives here um, and it definitely gives me a different perspective. Um, so, and, and it really did provide a great opportunity for these kids to be a part of the process. Next slide. Um, and to help engage the community. And so we utilize these images um, and this process at the first community workshop. They were a part of the presentation. That's actually Ignacio in one of those photos. Uh, and they, they, they gave a portion of the presentation. They led discussions at some of the some of the panel groups are at some of the group tables. Um, and it was just absolutely awesome to, to hear these kids kind of know some of the jargon, know some of the terminology, and also um, engage their peers in having a conversation on what can be changed. Next slide. So you, you, can't, you can't just have um, an acknowledgement, involvement, and engagement all, all separately. They all have to run concurrently, and you have to understand what are some of the elements that require um, you to be moldable and flexible. 
So you have to know who to involve and when to involve. And as we all have probably been a part of, there is a workshop sometimes where there's more staff in the room than there is residents. So if we look at what are some of the some of the uh, some of the statistics in and around your project area, we can utilize that information to better engage the community. So and that is part of it is killing the barriers in the room. So in our in our project area, we had 83% of the households um, had families with children which means schools is a great opportunity to go talk to these people. A lot of the, the people in there in the project area were Hispanic um, and there was language gaps. So you had to make sure that we had translators and we bring them with us. Um, you can see the medium income is lower, which means getting them to travel places are probably a little bit difficult, uh, but there still is definitely buying power because if we look at our leakage, there's a high amount of leakage. So there is definitely opportunity for these people to create commerce in their neighborhood, but just how do you do it? And some of the population growth is stagnant. Um, due to being lack of development in the project area. Next slide. So what did we do? Uh, we had to kill the barriers in the room and we had to go to them. So our, our consultant, WRT, came up with these awesome cards at the top, which are just different development types, which we explained to the communities. Uh, we gave them an overview of what the process was. And then we had, a, um, we had an activity, which is interactive and something you want to do is you want to make sure that you keep it interactive. Uh, um, and give them an opportunity to, to, to speak. And if you go to where they are and go to the, the places where they feel comfortable, oftentimes you get a great conversation. So they all voted on what they wanted to see in their neighborhood. They used the map to identify key problem areas or ideas um, um, and solutions for developing some of the, or to, to address some of those problems. And we use, I have dozens and dozens of these sheets, lay them out on the table, put some markers, start a conversation, and it ends up being awesome. And then at the end, they get to vote, which is gonna go into how our plan is created. Next slide. Um, and again, keep going, go to where they are. So um, adding, adding, adding work to, or adding benefit to the work that's already being done. This is at a local uh, um, Earth Day. We showed up and we had a big pop-up event. Um, we provided some additional funding um, some, that allowed for some additional food to be had for the residents, but we showed up and we, we conducted some of the same activities there. So going to where people are, going to where people are gonna be, going to where they're comfortable, uh, is a great way to get people involved. And again, this is t learning directly from a lot of our tab providers and the folks who have done it time and time again. You go to the next slide. Um, one thing that we, we had heard from, from people in the specific plan process, and we were worried with, with this process, was how are, we gonna, how are we gonna let people be aware that this obviously takes time? So we have to be honest with the community. The starting point is this plan, but getting Getting money and funding to do remediation is difficult. You also have to get partners, as it's been mentioned many times before, to, to be, become investors before you even see development. So one thing that was mentioned by Groundworks was think about the interim uses of some of these sites. What is ways that you can activate these sites and keep people engaged, whether it be cleanups or a variety of different um, uh, other activities you could have. Well, while we were at that, that Earth Day event, we had a local community leader um, suggest that we take a concept we had for a southern end of the portion and put it into something near the, the middle of the corridor that we were studying. Um, next slide. And so what we came up with was turning a vacant parcel, a key brownfield site on a key corridor into a temporary plaza. So this was a conceptual idea of can we, can we do something that allows for there to be events to address some of the needs people want, which includes food trucks and uh, or excuse me, includes access to food, access to parks, beautification of the neighborhood, um, and something for families to do. So we took this to the church, we took this to community members, and everybody was all in. Um, if you go to the next slide. So again, it, um, if you make vision in a team sport and you involve people throughout the process and you, you go to the schools and you go to churches and you go to community groups, um, if you go back to them with an idea of, of taking a vacant old site that looks pretty ugly and turned it into a beautiful plaza, uh, oftentimes they'll get on board and they'll be willing to come out and help. So we did that. We had two community build days where we had 150 and 75 community members come out respectively. We had 1,300 hours put in um, and it never hurts to ask. So obviously funding for this was gonna be difficult because this is an old site that had contamination and uh, in order to make it into something beautiful, we needed support from the community. And as my dad always said, the worst thing that happened is somebody could say no. We asked and we got over $75,000 in donations, whether it be work, services, or materials. Um, if you go to the next slide. And we've created the St. Rest um, Plaza on Elm Avenue. So all of the contaminated dirt that was on, a, on the portion of the site was taken and, appropriate and, and uh, removed and appropriately cleaned. 
they put on a new a new uh, completely new surface as a, a temporary cap for the time being which is composed of dg we created signage uh, we did a mural we created a a seating area there with old used pallets we created concession stands we got folks from the local carpenters union we got folks from the electrical union we got folks from the painters union to come out and help us assist build it with the community we got astroturf donated so there's about 2,000 square foot of reused astroturf out there we got a stage and we're already in the process of creating events and just like a little kid who gets a brand new t-shirt before we had our official grand opening if you go to the next slide we already had one event, which was Winter Wonderland, which we took one week to plan, and we have 350 community members come out. And again, this is going back to those community members, going to the schools, going to the community groups, um, letting them know, and they wanted something to do. They wanted beautification. And at this event, we had the local police department, or we had the police department give out food and drinks. We had the pastor of that church down there in the, in the corner dress up as Santa and take photos with Santa. We had activities where kids um, made gingerbread trees. Um, Candy trees, which was awesome. We had giveaways. We gave away over 300 presents. We gave away um, a couple hundred gloves and, and beanies. We gave away backpacks. We had food giveaways. And this is leading to, to more. So at, well, um, what's going to come next? Go to the next slide. Um, the plaza is becoming real. So we're going to, this Saturday, we're going to be painting this mural. Um, and April 20th, we're going to be opening up the official grand opening of the plaza. We have a formalized board that the, the church has put together. We have a collaboration with the local with Food Commons Fresno, which is a local CSA that's going to be hosting a farmer's market once a month. We have a variety of community uh, organizations that like to host events there, anything from birthday parties to Zumba classes to workshops to just play in the park. Um, so just going out there and getting involved and at, utilizing as many people as we possibly could. It went from something that seemed like a pie in the sky idea to now uh, something that's awesome that. I get to go by and every time I step on it, there's a community member that stops by, asks what's going on, asks when the next event is, um, and it's clearly created quite the buzz. Go to the next slide. To recap some of the, some of the lessons I learned throughout this pro process is uh, toolkit, that's empowering the folks around you. So utilize all organizations and make sure you have a toolkit um, for, for every partner that's gonna be involved so that they feel comfortable in the process. They don't feel like there's a information gap with them. They feel like they're a part of the team uh, that they have a role and essence before form. This is something I got from a from a, a local community member who who said it's it's really good to show up where people are to meet them and have a conversation with them before you get down to business. So if you can get down to to meeting people and, and uh, talking to folks and and becoming connected with them and having your face being seen, which is an awesome equity to have. That capital works wonders um, in the long run. Go out there, meet folks, shake hands, go to events that is happening, whether it's at a church, whether it's at a school or any community organization, go out there and um, uh, talk to folks. And then added value to work being done. So a lot of what we did was, was utilizing the organizations that are out there, uh, working with them, seeing how we could assist them and become a part of maybe an existing program they had and killing the barriers in the room. That means going to where people are, showing up at the times. I, I understand off, uh, that going, having community meetings, already you're, you're being taken away from your family. Um, but doing this is, is definitely fulfilling. If you go to a, a school or a church or an organization where people know each other, they're oftentimes more engaged than just the, the workshop that the city puts on. They want to talk to you. They want to have questions, and they're people that you can lean on in the future. And then make it a, make vision in a team sport. So involve all those folks throughout the entire process. Continuously go back to them um, because it just makes the process awesome, and it makes the whole, the whole thing worthwhile. And, again, this is why it's become kind of a dream project for me. Next slide is my last slide. Uh, this is one more photo from the Photo Voice student who, uh, if you guys look just to the side, there's a desired path because there is no end to the process. You always got to keep going, right? So there is no definite end. Um, that's how she described it to me, which I love. So I use it on all my PowerPoints. Thanks so much, Drew. And uh, if uh, you know if this audience were live, I'd ask for a big hand for our three great uh, presenters and their inspiring uh, presentations. And so we have a few questions here. The first question is, uh, what strategies might be employed during development of an area-wide plan when you have a single larger critical catalyst site within the focus area that has a property owner that is reluctant to participate in the process? So Katie Rose, Kate, and, uh, and Drew, uh, please. Uh, Chime in, whoever goes first, fine. 
So this is definitely a scenario that we have encountered in all three of the planning processes that we've undertaken related to Brownfield area-wide plans. I think the first key thing to remember is to engage the property owner early and often and in a way that frames their participation with the benefits to the property owner of their participation. For example, um, increased sales price if they're looking to develop it. Um, and any other framing that you think based on your community situation would be um, appealing to that property owner. I think one of the mistakes that we have seen communities um, undertake as part of this process is to make plans for specific sites without engaging the property owner. And that makes them more reluctant to engage if they're only finding out about the planning process midway through the process. I think the other thing too is to recognize that it may be going above and beyond the usual tactics for engaging somebody. Um, you may have an out-of-state property owner that you have to track down and you might need to speak to a commercial real estate broker. So there's just a lot of things to consider when reaching out to these um, these challenging property owners, but I can't overstate how important it is to have those property owners at the table. Um, I think it's also important to consider the uh, partnership of the property owner before even designating the catalyst site because you don't want to go into a planning process setting yourself up, self up for failure with the site that is unlikely to transact or have any participation from the property owner. So that's my two cents from my experience. Okay. I um, I would agree with that that on that last point particularly I think the you know a really strong community organizing process and this goes back to the partnership with the community based organizations um, you know investing in sort of like envisioning a, a, a number of different potential catalyst sites but having those conversations early before a formal planning process absolutely you don't want to put a property owner into a position where there's a public meeting and um, you know assuming they do show up right that they're going to get you know pressure um, nobody likes to have to make a commitment in public i don't know anybody that likes to get put on the spot like that so um you know it, i would say like try the carrot uh, first um and you know sort of like work with the community to have those discussions um, about what might be wonderful to see on a site and you know, kind of hopeful visionary stuff, but also you gotta manage expectations alongside that, like this property owner might not move or might not choose to participate. So hopefully if you're painting that picture well, um, you're stirring that heart and mind to, to kind of change and get them to come to the table. Yes, and this is Ignacio. Uh, I, I think we've also, uh, CCLIR has participated in what are called visioning exercises or vision to actions with, which is some, uh, some area-wide planning grantees apply, but this is something that's specific to one site where you can actually lay out what the community would like to see on that site and actually have some, uh, some back of the envelope number crunching so that you can actually show uh, the property owner that there is an, uh, maybe uh, uh, financially uh, feasible reuses on that site uh, if they're resistant or they really just don't have an idea of what's possible on that site. Uh, the next question is for Drew. And Drew, uh, you can answer the first question and also the second question, which is, uh, how did you deal with the potential exposure and contaminants and liability on the St. Rest site for that community event you did? Um, so the, the first question, I, I don't think I would have anything to add. In fact, I was taking some notes because we have a large property owner that has been somewhat difficult, but um, keeping them, uh, having a, an individual conversation with them has been helpful because Randomly, they'll come up. They'll they'll come around to some of the ideas we have and ask for more information. Uh, some of the some of the dealt with potential exposure to contamination uh, on the the cleanup of the site was was one going have a, having the company of the construction company that uh, did some of the uh, uh, that did some of the hauling away. We had them go out and spray water. We also used masks, um, and we also had them use one of their local environmental consultants to test some of the, the exposure. So we had a phase one and phase two done. Uh, so in certain areas where we knew that there was a higher level of contamination, we didn't want to kick it up. We didn't have people work in those areas until after 
the um, the construction company came in and disposed of the the um, the contaminated dirt. So most of the the build one day was done on an area of just picking up some of the some of the the dust and debris and doing some of the general construction. And then after that second phase was done or of uh, um, cleaning up the soil. Then we had a larger group come out to do some of the larger construction projects. Thank you. And this would be the last question. And any other questions, we please send them in and we will reply by email. But to all our panelists, is that how would you recommend using this area-wide planning model with a multi-purpose grant since EPA does no longer has the area-wide planning grant? Well, I think is that I had, this is Katie Rose and Brianna. One of the things that I'd mentioned during my presentation is that while the specific area-wide planning grant no longer exists under that title, a lot of the 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 um, tasks that were eligible for funding under that area-wide planning grant can now be performed as an eligible activity under the multi-purpose grant. So I would strongly encourage you to reach out to your local um, or your regional EPA project office to speak to them specifically about um, confirming whether or not those activities that you have proposed can be uh, covered under that grant. But my understanding, based on the new multi-purpose grant guidelines that were released uh, for the current year competition and potentially moving forward, is that the planning activities that you could do under the old area-wide planning grant can also be performed as part of the scope of work under the new multi-purpose grant, as well as the assessment grant. So yes, I would encourage you to contact your, your regional EPA office. And I would uh, agree with that. Uh, that's, that's what we recommend to, to folks who ask us. So it's uh, a little past, uh, a minute past the hour. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers again for your great presentations. Uh, and uh, please uh, 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 respond to the survey that's going to be popping up on your screen. Uh, if not right after, shortly, we'll be sending it out. Again, thank you. Thank you to our speakers again. Uh, look out for future EP, uh, C, uh, C clear webinars. And good afternoon to everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.